Hey, welcome back to Nick Beardia. I'm glad to see that he finally broke a hundred thousand. We finally did it. It's good to see. It's good to see he finally met his goal. And it's all thanks to you out there who listen. And for you today, we have another section of Herr Schnitzel Nazi, the pig roast. We last left off the game with me being the only surviving party member, and no one within the state we were in who could translate the text that we needed. We were two children, a camp counselor, a senator, his bodyguard, a mentally challenged redneck, a hobo, and an African warlord down, and I needed to fill my ranks once again so I could continue my crusade. You see, with the destruction of his car, the cultists made this battle personal, and he wasn't going to stop until every single one of them Scientologist commie motherfuckers was dead. My first step was to roam the ruins of the town and look for suitable survivors who would be willing to assist me in my crusade. Wasn't too easy, as most of the town's populace was either killed, ran away, or rendered irreversibly insane in the battle between us and the cult slash monsters. The GM had all the other players start rolling up characters who would act as survivors in the town. The president of the Tabletop Club, aka Gobbledick and Hobo Joe's player, made a character named Sergeant Jackson, a marine whose tour of duty recently ended and lost his wife in the recent battle. The president's girlfriend, aka Chuck and Buddy the camp counselor's player, who for some reason would only play as male characters, but hey, I don't judge, made the character Josephi, the mustached Eastern European man whose smoothie store was destroyed in the battle. She described him as a short and broad-shouldered man with a mustache that would make Mario and Joseph Stalin blush. The girl who played both of the child characters decided to mix things up here, and this time play as a teenage girl. This was Tiffany Goldstein, a 16-year-old girl whose boyfriend and entire family were killed at the gas station. She fortunately didn't know that it was Herr Schnitzel Nazi who flew the plane. Senator Fister's next character was Wolf Staggs, a hardcore survivalist who just happened to be in town when it was attacked, and who was also staying in the hotel that we were at, which apparently caught fire not long after the battle started. And then there's Coney's character, my best friend at my university. I had no idea what he was going to do, and so when we were walking to the meeting place together, I asked the guy and what he told me, I had to admit, was pretty fucking good. He was playing as Jason Knight, a ghost hunter. He was a man who ran one of those ghost hunting TV shows, so he always had his camera on him. He filmed the entirety of the battle and wanted to head out with me for the views. So, on with the adventure. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the video, but I just want to talk to you about our new affiliate, Reroll. Reroll is a D&D 5th edition character builder app. Now, everyone needs a character sheet app for a tabletop game, but what makes Reroll stand out above all the rest is its character art. I personally find the character art really, really cool. It has this beautiful retro pixel art aesthetic and they are continually adding new races and items so you can customise it whatever way you want. They currently have 14 supported races, over 150 weapons and over 400 pieces of armour you can mix and match from to really make your character come to life. And the best part, you can have your own little cute companion like a little baby penguin, a flying kitty, a stupid looking pug or my personal favourite, a little corgi. And the best thing about Reroll, it has a free version with limited character art so you can try before you buy and see if you like it or not. We personally think it's an amazing app that will just improve your overall enjoyment of tabletop role playing games. Reroll is on Apple, Android, Desktop and if you use our coupon code NECKBEARDIA at checkout you get 10% off. It's a great affiliate that we think you guys will love but enough of that, let's get back to the video. I went to each character one by one and started gathering them. By the time I got all five together, we were in one of the many abandoned bars in town. I was behind the bar making drinks for everyone. When I was all done, I stood on the bar. Dirty Schwein have taken things all from us. Back in the 1930s and 40s, we had similar problem. 
Trouble is, I can't remember who was responsible. Could it have been the Scientologists? The Vietnamese? Commies? Fucking Mormons? I don't know. But whoever has done this to us is going to pay, aren't they? The others were all quite enthusiastic about murdering the cultist. Excellent, meine Freunde. I know what we're up against, and I have some of the means and the will, but I need you. You will be my soldiers, and I your glorious Fuhrer. Together we shall sweep across this cult, crushing all in our path. We shall create a world free from this cult of commies for a thousand years. After my inspiring speech, we hotwired three undamaged cars and took them back to our camp. We've also found that on their way out of town, the cultists had resurrected the dead civilians to cover their escape. I think I personally scored a new record in zombie road kills. When we got back to the camp, the kids were all really broken up about the death of Coney. We held a small, tasteful funeral, something that those that fell during a fire and blood would have appreciated. After the funeral preparations were made, we spent a lot of time trying to come up with what to do next. We knew that in order to defeat the cult and its master, this god in the lake, we had to understand it better. Only problem with that was that everything we stole was in the language that none of us could read properly. And the only person that we knew of that was in the state of Montana had been incinerated by... Well, that's not really important, okay? We also couldn't infiltrate the cult because they had to invite people to join their commune, like we were at first. I don't know why I started thinking about it, but I remembered that demon that accidentally summoned. I recalled the way the GM had described it, made it sound exactly like one of the star spawn of Great Cthulhu, which meant that I was invoking the words of Cthulhu. I suddenly realized that there were Cthulhu cults everywhere, and that we could get one of them to read the text. The group looked at me like I was nuts. Why would they help us? And there are no Cthulhu cultists around here, they asked. They will be, because they're going to come here, I said. I felt bad for doing what I was about to do. Even Herr Schnitzel Nazi had limits to the depths of depravity that he was willing to sink to, but I knew there was no other way. We had to make a disturbance big enough for Cthulhu in his ever-dreaming state to notice. We asked one of the other camp counselors to take up the job of reading the eulogy for the PCs that died. Taking a hint from the director's cut of the tales of Old Man Henderson, we set up a projector for the entire camp to say certain lines of prayer along with one another. While they were doing this, we were all extremely far away, and for good reason. All 200 of the kids and camp counselors said those exact summoning words I had said so long ago, bringing in 200 of the star spawn Cthulhu to the immediate area. The demons immediately started. God damn it. The demons immediately started massacring everything in sight, and when everyone was dead, they turned on each other. I felt so bad that I did this, even in the game, but it was truly the only way. By the time everything in the camp was good and dead, I lit up a joint in order to commemorate all of the children and friends who died so that the world could be saved. About a week later, we laid low, sticking out some of the surrounding non-obliterated towns, listening for rumors. We of course heard things like, I heard that an entire summer camp was massacred by wild animals, or I heard that some town just got destroyed. Some people say they saw an SS officer there. But eventually we heard a rumor about a large group of strangers was coming around town and asking about the massacre that took place at the summer camp. The plan had worked. Then began phase two of my master genius plan. We had also been preparing the area by making various bombs, smoke grenades, pyrotechnics, and setting up extremely expensive surround sound systems around the gathering area at the camp. When the Cthulhu cultists came to check out the area, we were waiting for them. When the cultists arrived, we set off the smoke bombs, and then started playing Gangnam Style. Our campaign was set in the very specific year of 2012, and was the most annoyingly catchy song that we could think of. Then, with all the cultists all confused, we proceeded to set off explosives and fire traps right there. Additionally, because of the layout of the area, they couldn't really escape out of the bowl of death. 
According to the GM, right then and there, more than half of the cultists were dead, and the survivors had absolutely no idea what was going on and were highly disorientated. It was at that moment that the spits were inserted. Jason, Wolf, and I approached them from one half of the Bowl of Death, and Sergeant Jackson, Josephi, and Tiffany all attacked from the other half. We took exceptional care to leave only one survivor, who was a teenage girl no older than Tiffany. We thought she'd be scared, but the zealous girl immediately pulled out a... But the zealous girl immediately pulled out a Glock and started firing on us. Thankfully, Wolf came up from behind, disarmed, and subdued her. Then the interrogation began. I looked the girl dead in the eyes and rolled a critical success on Intimidate. Being so scared that she actually pissed herself, the girl agreed to assist us. She read through all of our papers that we could procure and told us everything that we needed to know. According to her, the god in the lake was not actually physically in the lake. Well, he was, sort of. It was sort of like his spirit was. According to her, the god in the lake is one of the great old ones and came to Earth not long before Great Cthulhu did. The gods did battle, and it resulted in Cthulhu's victory in successively destroying his physical form. But ever since then, the spirit has been trapped in that lake, and has spent so long trying to get out once again. To do so, it needs human cultists. According to the notes written by Director Scott, the head of the cult, they needed human cultists who had become the mindless brethren, for ritualistic and more mindful purposes. The Brethren were actually a sort of larval form of great monsters, which they would one day become. That thing that we saw come out of the lake so long ago was one such greater monster. We also discovered that the gigantic monster that attacked us in the city was what happened when the essence of the god mated with a human female. We thanked the Cthulhu cultists, but decided to keep her with us until our job was complete. We decided we liked her, and wanted a few more adventures with her. And thus ends the pig roast. I will come out with the incident with the boats probably around tomorrow or the next day. Take care my lovely fans and enjoy. We're getting to the end game, baby. Herr Schnitzel Nazi will return. And that's the end of the pig roast. The last bit is in is in the script, so it's not me saying that, it's him saying that. But yeah, hope you all enjoyed. I didn't get fucking day drunk this time, which is always nice. And of course, if you like this video and others like them, be sure to like and subscribe to Neckbeardia. And click the bell icon so you know when the next video is released, whenever it is. This has been Guard Bro, and this is Neckbeardia.